Hello and welcome to another edition of Beyond the Hype with Black Enterprise, the number one black media brand in the country with more than 9 million unique visitors a month. I'm Alfred Edmund Jr., Senior Vice President and Executive Editor at Large at Black Enterprise. And this episode of Beyond the Hype is brought to you by J.P. Morgan Chase. You know, guys, you know how passionate I am about wellness, health, fitness, and especially mental wellness. I'm especially excited about our Beyond the Hype guest today. He is the author of a brand new book that we're going to get into called The Joy of the Disinherited. Um, he is the CEO of Hurdle, which is a cutting edge new uh, telehealth startup. Um, that's how I first got to, to, to know him because of, of his being the CEO of this new startup. Um, and he recently just moderated a great session on black male mental health at Black Men Excel. Please welcome to Beyond the Hype, Kevin Durden. Thanks for joining us, Kevin. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you for having me. Great to be here with you. Listen, I got to say, I, I know I mentioned uh, you moderated the session at our 2021 Black Men Excel um, um, mental, uh, Black Men Excel Summit, the session on Black male mental health. And I think I told you that that session um, is, is one of the most popular sessions, if not the most popular session at that event since we launched it in uh, 2015, no, 2017. Um, so I just want to say that again, I said it to you privately, but you did a wonderful, wonderful job of moderating and leading that session. I so appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I, you know, as I even said then, um, I think the Black Enterprise has been on the cutting edge of talking about these issues um, for a while. In the last year has sort of become very popular to talk about Black men's mental health. But, you know, you and I, I believe thanks to your leadership, you know, Black Enterprise, you know, started talking about this, this, this subject of Black men's mental health before others were sort of on the bandwagon. And so I really apply you for your leadership and making sure that this conversation um, it was being had, you know, a couple of years back. Well, people know, follow me, know my journey. I talk about my therapist and mental wellness in my own life all the time, but I think it's important, especially in the current environment, for not, us not to only seek it, but to talk about seeking it to further destigmatize this. I tell people going to see my therapist is no different than going to see my, my, um, my physician about, you know, any, you know, getting a checkup and getting, dealing with my screenings. And, and I think we're doing a lot of great work to normalize that in America in general and among um, in the black community, among black men in particular. But that's why, again, I'm excited that you're on the show. And let me give a nod to the, the two other brothers that was on that session, um, Jay Barnett and Jeff Rocker, who, who are um, family therapists and relationship therapists, who also did a great job on that session. Absolutely. But, Let's jump right right into to you know what I was excited about having this conversation. First of all, I think it would be helpful for for our listeners and our audience to get an understanding of your journey. How how did you come to to where you are now, the CEO of Hurdle? Um, and I definitely want to jump into what mo moved you to write um, the Joy of the Disinherited. But talk about who you are, your journey to where you are now. I know you're a public health um, professional. Um, been in that you know, in that space for a, a minute. Just, just tell us, give me a little bit of, of insight into your journey. Yeah, well, thank you. You know, first of all, Alfred, I would just say that um, I was home uh, last uh, two weeks ago um, for a book signing, at, which is Little Rock, Arkansas, by the way. Uh, and no one is more surprised at where I am today than I am. Like, I'm still like, okay, well, how did I land here? Like, it's, it's one of those things. But um, you know, I'm from Little Rock, um, grew up in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, and really thought that I would have um, early on a career in, in public service and eventually evolved into, as you mentioned, a career in public health. And that, you know, work in public health would eventually take me to Washington, D.C., where I sort of thought that I would spend the rest of my life growing um, a public health consulting practice. And, you know, um, that seemed to be the course that I was going to take for the first several years I, after I moved here to D.C. And then I worked myself into mental exhaustion. Um, and then my mental exhaustion led to a period of depression. And my depression was crippling, you know, arresting. And I struggled to find a therapist who I could connect with, um, which is not uncommon for ethnic minorities 
In fact, 50% of ethnic minorities terminate therapy prematurely because of the lack of provider fit. And so um, after I did find a therapist, which by the way, would become our first um, clinical officer um, at our company in the first iteration of it, um, you know, somebody asked me had I ever considered doing anything in digital health. And that was one of those questions that, you know, I think we've all had these moments where somebody asks us a question and a light goes off and we, you know, those of us of, of the faith persuasion believe that, you know, sort of we've got a nudge from, from God that, okay, this is the direction you, you need to go in. And so it was in that moment that I decided that I was going to devote the next chapter of my career, in particular at that time, to the mental health of Black men. First generation of our company was called Henry Health. We were super focused on serving Black men. And we've not gotten away from that. It's in our DNA. Um, but that's how our company started. Um, and, you know, here we are three years later, we are among the uh, only 2% of venture backed companies that are led by minority founders, which is a, a pretty unique opportunity, Alfred, because that means that we really have a, an opportunity to grow something um, that's national, that's scalable, that meets the needs of people where they are. And I'm just incredibly proud of that and humbled that. You know, as my grandma said, I can be in the service, you know. Amen. Amen. And as a, as a fellow brother of faith, I, I, I share your whole experience about God tapping you on the shoulder and saying, listen, you weren't thinking about this, but I've been thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about this before you were created. So yes, sir. Yes, now's the sir. moment. Now's the moment that I've been leading you to all along. Uh, you know, and again, one of the things that fascinates me about your story and, and about you because again, this is black enterprise. So my first iteration of my knowledge of you is as a business person. Oh, there's this new startup, Henry Health. He's the CEO. That's rare, <laughs> like you said, in terms of, of venture backed startups. Um, and again, of course, that that was you know kind of the initial iteration of how the black enterprise audience got to know you. Um, but of course, since then, the company has, has evolved, and I've gotten to to learn more about you. Uh, Guys, when I follow you on social media, it's not just because I want to see what you post. I'm learning about people. I'm learning about people yeah, maybe, yeah. And, what the, and, and their journey and how they can contribute to the success of, of, of Black Enterprise, the Black Enterprise audience. So again, it, the more I learned about you and your journey, I was impressed with it as a business story. Um, um, now that I've read, um, and I haven't read the whole book yet, I just got it, but I've been begun reading your book. And of course, then you moved me to say, go, why have I never read um, Jesus and the <laughs> disinherited that yeah. inspired, you know, the joy of the disinherited. A a a again, so your whole evolution, I was like, I need to get this brother on this show because the evolution, <laughs> the evolution you know. So talk to me exactly about what Hurdle does in particular and why and why that work is important, particularly, as you say, between the pandemic, um, the, the, the struggle for racial equity and racial justice, and, and, and even if you took that off the table, just the challenges of life that, that we too often, because the, the, the strains and the injuries and the pains are invisible, we basically yeah. dismiss them until there's a major breakdown. And I tell people, you know, I, I see, I have a standing point with my therapist every week. It doesn't always happen. It's a standing point if I'm traveling. We, but I tell people I do it because I don't want to treat mental wellness as emergency medicine. That, that, yeah. that, that was part of my maintenance routine I'm fine, but it's a part of a maintenance routine. And probably like you, uh, or like most people, my first interactions with therapists, which was going back now, man, 25, 30 years, was because there was a major breakdown. In my case, yeah. the failure of my first marriage led me to see my first therapist for the first time. Um, but about 10 years ago, I was like, no, I don't wanna just do this every time there's a breakdown. I wanna treat it like my car, <laughs> scheduled maintenance. So, so just talk to me about what Hurdle does, uh, how that relates to your own experience as a black man who, who you know, found mental wellness to be a priority. Um, and, and, you know, just so our audience can give a clear picture of, of, which, of your work and how that relates. Yeah. To that. You know, where, where I'd like to start is where the company started. Um, you know, after my depression, I started talking very publicly, at least among my friends, about what it meant to be depressed. 
And what I learned in my vulnerability is that there was an invitation for others to tell me about what they experienced. And there I realized that, um, that there was sort of like this quiet, if you will, um, trend among Black men and Black people of suffering from mental health issues and not getting the help that they needed. And so I realized that there was a, a problem, like, oh, this is a big problem. And I, I really wanted, you know, first to sort of try to, um, you know, raise the awareness around it. But, you know, the idea of building a solution is like, again, that was like you said, God tapping me on my shoulder to say, okay, to go this direction now. And so the company started from this place of understanding that even before the pandemic, African-Americans were 20% more likely to experience mental health issues than the general population. And as I mentioned earlier, 50% um, more likely to terminate therapy prematurely because of the lack of provider fit. So at Hurdle, um, we face this hard truth, Alfred. And the hard truth is that the mental health care system as we know it was not designed for everyone. It was designed as a luxury and a privilege for middle-class white Americans who've experienced a single trauma. And you say, well, Kevin, that's a pretty bold statement. And indeed it is, but it is a hard truth. You know, African-Americans were believed to be too simple for talk therapy. For those who were enslaved, who ran away from plantations, they were diagnosed with a mental condition. The APA recently issued an apology for its role in racism and systemic racism in the mental health care system. So at Hurdle, we face that hard truth. And because of that, we train our therapists in an evidence-based technique that helps them improve their cultural humility and cultural responsiveness. And Alfred, I'm excited to report that our clients are persisting two to three times the national average. Wow, which that's is saying, remarkable. That is saying something, man. Yeah, it is remarkable. We're averaging nine and a half sessions. Um, and I'm incredibly proud of that, um, you know, because what this means is that people are going to return to work um, happier. They're going to be more productive. They're going to be better fathers, better people in their communities. And so this is the mission of the company is to make sure that people regardless of how they look, um, can get the care that they need and the care that they deserve. Um, acknowledging that the current system is filled, as you said earlier, with invisible barriers uh, and just candidly not designed for us. You know, uh, one of the things that we touched on, I think even during Black Men Excel, is, is and, you, and you touched on already in this conversation, is the fact that we are sorely underrepresented as black people and as black men, as care, care providers, as professionals in this, in this space, as therapists, as counselors, as psychiatrists, as psychologists in this space. Um, so so I, I don't know if I made the point or, or, no, or, or, or you guys made the point during the session that that means that the idea of cultural competence training, it can't be just limited to black people in the profession since all of us are not going to get access to a black therapist, if you will, if, if that's what we desire. Yeah. So talk, talk to me about, about how you see that unfolding, how, how Hurdle addresses that issue. Uh, let me say this. My current therapist is a white male old enough to be my father. Um, <laughs> and he's great. I mean, he's great, but I found that he's not great. I want him to come work for Hurdle. <laughs> he, he could. I mean, really, because, I, mean, I you know, recently I had this scare because since he is an older man, and I, I was I had to woke up suppose something happens to him and, and, I, and I ended up doing some research about his background, which I hadn't done, um, not not his immediate background in terms of him being qualified, but his whole journey of, you know, I went and looked at his, his career. And so he well, he's not culturally competent by accident. It turns out way back in the late 60s, he made a conscious decision that he was going to focus on on uh, he specializes in black males, black young, you know, especially teenagers, young adults. I don't know, maybe it was because of the, the, the you know, the 60s civil rights movement and the, whatever it was, he had made that his goal as a young man. And so it's not an accident that he, he's, he's effective at what he does with me as a black man. I, 
and and and, and he also helped my son for a short period of time when he was a teenager. But I guess my point is cultural competence has to be intentional. That kind of training has to be intentional. Yeah. Talk to me about about how you guys approach that 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 reality um, with Hurdle. Well, yeah, it's, there, there's sort of two two major points I want to make. Actually, there are three major points. Mm -hmm. The first point I'm going to make that you are right. Pardon me, less than four percent of the therapists in the country are people of color, and so this idea that you're going to be able to match people based on demographic information is not even possible for at least a couple more generations, right? It's just, you just don't have the workforce. Um, and then secondly, I believe that um, social work and psychologists, psychiatrists, like this is, you know, what we call the, the noble professions, sort of like teaching, nobody sort of sets out to do this work with malicious intent. The problem is that the, the system and how they're trained um, is inadequate. Even our very best therapists have one day devoted to black folk, one day devoted to Hispanic folk, and now they've added a day devoted to members of the LGBTQ community, right? And at face value, we know that that is um, a deficient way of supporting the diversity of our country. And so what we do at Hurdle, we have a technique that was um, created by one of our clinical advisors who's a professor at Johns Hopkins that we is our core training. And we train our therapists in this technique, which helps them with their cultural humility and cultural responsiveness. And we provide ongoing support to our therapists so that they will be able to support a diverse population. Now, the final point I want to make with you, Alfred, is a bit of pushback. And it's not a pushback against you, but it's really a pushback about how we in America, and particularly in corporate America, and even in nonprofit America, have accepted this language of cultural competency. Mm. We don't use cultural competency at Hurdle. We use three terms around this. And let me tell you first why we don't use competency. You and I have a lot of in common, I'd imagine. Our, we, we figured that out even in this conversation, like our faith, um, you know, we're black men. Um, you have a son, I have a son. I think your son's older than mine though. But we have a lot in common. But the idea that I can be competent, if we understand the, what the definition of competent is, in your culture is a really arrogant position to take. And so as you describe your therapist, what I think he was, instead of competent, he was intentional, which meant I want to learn more. And he had humility, which made him more responsive, right? So at Hurdle, the, the language that we use around this is cultural intentionality, cultural humility, and cultural responsiveness. And we push back on this notion because we don't want our therapists to be overly confident. Oh, I'm competent. No, you never reach a point that you should stop learning about the richness of the diversity of people. You know, you make such a good point. I want you to repeat those, those three things. Cultural intentionality, Humility cultural and humility responsiveness. And cultural responsiveness. And, and you said, in a nutshell, what makes my therapist so great? He never comes to a session acting like he already knows. Bringing his own biases, Bring his, own bias, his own beliefs, his own assumptions, even assumptions based on the fact that he's known me for a decade. It's, it's always like what's happening now and not let me tell you what's happening now. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, that is so powerful. And, and this is what I love about doing the show, because I'm all about learning something new and rethinking, um, thinking again. And, and well, man, well all powerful. of us, I think it's probably fair to say for the last 20 years have used this language around cultural competency. Mm, yes. And, and, and I just think the last year in this 
racial reckoning that we've gone through that if we're honest about it, like language is important. Like we should always be very careful with language. Uh, you know that as an editor, right? No doubt, no doubt. Um, so this, this ideal of competency is sort sure, of like, I don't mean to push back as an indictment on people, but really what I'm trying to do is elevate our positioning and our thinking about these issues so that we might better support people. That is so powerful. That is, I mean, thank you for that. I'm personally, thank you for that. Um, I, I deeply appreciate it. So let me, before I go too far, how does our audience access Hurdle? Where there's uh, we're, for others? We're, yeah, so we're growing very rapidly. Uh, right now we provide services in DC, Maryland, Virginia, Texas, California, and Massachusetts. And 2021 will expand into right at another half dozen to uh, 10 states. Um, but we're at hurdle.health. Um, and people can also follow us on all major social media platforms. And if you're in a state that we're not in, we have sort of a waiting list on our website where you can join. If you work for an employer, um, you can suggest to your employer that they should be working with us. Um, you can also suggest to your payer that they should be working with us. We work very hard to be able to accept um, um, you know, forms of payment from all major payers. Um, because we know that we, we want to remove all of the barriers for accessing the care that people need. But that, that's really amazing. So now I want to jump into the book and why you wrote it. <laughs> you wrote it why you wrote it. I was fascinated. Again, I was just reading the foreword and you talked about your experience with being told by none other than the, the, um, Andrew Young, the ambassador. That young man, I think you were like 14 or something. But that, that was actually Otis Moss uh, the third. Oh, no, that's right. It wasn't you. It was Otis Moss the third. It was yeah, the one who wrote yeah. the forward for you. Not, not yeah. you. Not you. I, I got the things mixed up. But but still, it was. But no, that, that's, the, that's the story he told. Absolutely. That's the story that, he told, uh, you know. uh, Andy Young said to him, you need to go read Howard Thurman. And as someone who reads voraciously, Part of me was like, I'm surprised I haven't read this book. Because when I posted it on Instagram, because whenever I'm about to read a book, I tell people now reading, as you see I, I did with, with your yeah. book. And I was flooded by people who were like, oh my God, that's a classic. You got to read it. You got to read it. You got to read it. So, <laughs> so I, I, I owe you another thank you because I'm like, I don't know how I missed it, but now I got two great books that I'm working on. Alfred, with. I'll let you in on a secret. I don't know how I missed it either. I randomly discovered Howard Thurman. I'll tell you what I discovered. It's just so funny how small the world is. Uh, I follow Jesse Jr., uh, uh, and Junior is really active on um, social media, and he posted a Howard Thurman quote that that resonated with me. And I said, oh, "This is interesting." And so I I went then and started like you know YouTube and um, watching like lectures about Thurman. Before the week was over, I'd ordered like three of his books, and just I mean I basically got. Um, became a Howard Thurman fanatic in less than a two, three week period. I think, I, I think that's happening to me too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that saying, you don't eat the fruit of the seeds you plant, but somebody's going to eat it. We're bringing yeah. a lot of great fruit that other people have been planting all around us. And now we're getting the fruit from it, you know, yeah. but yeah, but, but again, talk, talk to me about the book, why you wrote it. What, what, what do you, what do you, what does it express about you and your journey and, and what you hope people will get out of reading it? Well, you know, the, the first thing I should say, um, after, I, after I experienced, or when I was experiencing depression, Alfred, I was trying very hard to make sense of what was happening to me. Um, as I wrote in the book, there was never a time in my life that I called on God and God did not come to my rescue. So I first was trying to understand my depression theologically. And I was trying to make sense of it. And when I couldn't figure that out and couldn't negotiate with God, would help me get an understanding of it, I sort of turned to a purely intellectual path then. Then I started studying clinical theory, trying to figure out like what in the world is going on? Why am I so unhappy? And why has God left me? 
And, you know, I think I was starting to, I had a foundation of like how I thought about this, but it wasn't until I came across the work of Howard Thurman that my ideas around Black folk in particular um, were cemented around our mental health and our struggle in America. So in Jesus and the Disinherited, Thurman argues that there are three, pardon me, primary ways that Black folk, quote, the disinherited, respond to oppression. He says, number one, they imitate the oppressor. Number two, they keep a safe distance from their oppressor. And then number three is outright resistance. So, you know, what I attempted to do in, in my book is offer my story and my family's story as a vulnerable offering to show how oppression, trauma, historical trauma impacts our mental health. Um, you know, the, the final thing I'll just say about why I wrote the book. Um, so obviously, you know, I've been in therapy and um, my therapist was suggesting that I start journaling. And, and when I started journaling, I realized, oh, this is the book I've been wanting to write. I wanted to write a, a book about the health of Black men. In fact, you wouldn't believe it, Alfred. Six years ago, I bought the domain whatskillingblackmen.com, thinking that that was the title of my book. Mm. That's how serious I was about that. And uh, I just couldn't get a rhythm. But last summer, I started journaling. And a couple weeks into journaling, I realized that that was my book. And at the same time was the same collision when I was sort of coming across the work of Howard Thurman and my ideas around this receiving thing. So I wrote the book first for myself. The book is very raw. It is like me. It is the power of, of remembering and even the power of confessional writing. Um, it was, so that was for me. But then secondly, I wrote the book for you and, and, and your audience. Um, number one, as an invitation to them to do what Howard Thurman talks about, this deep internal inward look, reflection. Right. What are the lies you've been told about yourself? What are the half truths you've been told about yourself? Howard Thurman says that we must perform a surgery on our psyche with the precision of a surgeon. And and that's my invitation to people. It's like take this journey, discover your joy. Use my 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 path as an example. And then number three, when you do that. So many of us have experience deep pain, generational trauma, that we are inadequately prepared to handle on our own. So in that way, I wrote the book to demystify the process of therapy, meaning what is therapy like? When should you go? And, you know, Alfred, I am so humbled about how the book is landing because um, it's, it's doing the work that I hoped it would do. People are taking that inward look and, and people are saying to me, well, how do how do I start? And I'm like, oh, geez, I don't have the prescription for you because I think the prescription is individual. Like every everybody needs their own mental health maintenance strategy, as you alluded to earlier. But I think, you know, the book offers a path of how you might begin to do that in that work. You know, you hit on so many points that I personally um, identify with. First time, first of all, I now know that the first time I was really depressed, I didn't realize it. I didn't have a language to discuss it. The first, my first real bout of depression actually happened um, while well, I was an undergraduate in college at Rutgers University, everybody, I'm a, I'm a big Rutgers alum, you know, um, very enthusiastic uh, alum of Rutgers University. But uh, during my sophomore year, I literally, and my mother, God bless her soul, because she's home with the Lord now, um, doesn't know, never knew that I actually got kicked out of school, technically. I never had to, had to leave campus, 
but I went a whole semester and I was not going to class. Um, mm -hmm. I had gone through my first breakup, my first serious relationship with a, with a girl in college. And my roommate was literally physically dumping me out of the bed to try to get me to go to class. I mean, that's how bad it was. And I ended that semester with two incompletes, two Fs, and two zeros. You know, incompletes Fs. My, my truly grade for that semester was a zero. And as, as, as a result, mm -hmm. I technically got kicked out of school. But of course, they give you a probationary period. I rebounded. I never sought help. I, I guess just the, the scare of almost getting kicked out of college got me back on track enough to get to really you know attend classes again. But I didn't recognize that I was that that was about a depression at the time, an episode of depression at the time. And I certainly didn't recognize the connection to underlying previous traumas, both in my own life and pre-generational until many, many, many years later. So so this idea of getting started on this journey is really important. And, and again, I'm not you know, I'm early in the book, so it, it, I can always say you're right. It is it is not playing around. It is cutting to the marrow of, 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 of what we need to do to get on a path of health, wellness. It's beyond know. the hype. It, it's absolutely beyond the hype. Again, <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Uh, because particularly on social media, there is a certain amount of hype. I think it's still healthy that people are talking about it, but there's a self, not, self, certain amount of hype around self-healing and self-care that often is very surface and doesn't go to the, to the marrow the way you, you do. But the second thing that I... I, I uh, identify strongly with that I think is a, a major theme of getting on the path to wellness in the Black community is this whole balancing act between being people of faith. And I'm the grandson of a Baptist minister. I was raised in the church. I love the Lord. You know, I'm, you know my, my, my spiritual walk is very important to me. And this idea of seeking therapy. And we know in our culture, often we're told, you need a therapist, you need to go pray. You need a therapist, you need to go talk to your pastor. You need a therapist, you need to get in the Word. And uh, I remember it, it, the second time we did the, the mental wellness session for Black Men at Black Men Excel, um, the live version before the pandemic, a person did stand up and say, I don't need a therapist, I got God. And I happened to be moderating that session. I said, well, I thank God for my therapist. <laughs> I thank God every day for my therapist. But talk to me about, uh, you, you know, again, your first instinct when you went through your depression was to, to do the natural thing, the culturally natural thing for us, go to God. Um, that's certainly what my grandmother, you know, the first lady <laughs> to my, my, my minister grandfather would have told us. Um, and, and it's very well-meaning. And this is, not, for, tell me, this is not about a lack of faith in God. But t talk to me about how you navigated that in, in, in your own experience. Yeah, and I, I write about this a lot. Um, you know, as I, I said earlier, in... In, in my life, there had never been a time that I called on God and asked God for something and didn't get it. I mean, I sort of felt like I had like this direct line, you know, like, okay, if I pray for that, I'll get it next week, da da da, you know? <laughs> um, but there became this point that, um, you know, like none of my prayers worked, my energy was low. And depression is like that, you know, it's, it's such a, a dark cloud hovering over you. Um, and, and that's what it was like. And when I realized that was happening to me, at first I tried to make sense of it theologically. So I tried to figure out like, did I do something? Did I grieve God? Like, how did I fall out of good grace with God? And then, you know, I started studying constructs like the dark night of the soul. And one of the books that was super helpful for me is a book by Barbara Brown Taylor called Learning to Walk in the Darkness. And, you know, I think this is a really important conversation for Black folk because of, you know, our faith, our belief system, that we've been taught that God is not in the darkness, right? That you, that, that you know, that, 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 that light and darkness are like two competing constructs and God is in one, but he's not in the other. And through Barbara's work in this book, and I refer to the book in my book, you know, she studied the construct of guard, uh, darkness. She sat in caves and, and discovered the beautiful crystals at night that you can only see if you sit in the darkness. And so I think for me, um, I never let go of my faith because it was, you know, I have this faith that was instilled in me by my ancestors, my grandparents. I heard her humming songs 
And this is the sort of weird position about sort of the disinherited, right? We're in this, this weird place in life that we know God loves us, but yet we're always been subjected to oppression and mistreated. And so, but we hold on to this belief that God loves us, right? And, and so I never let go of that. Um, and I actually think that it was a fundamental process of my development around like these ideas. And eventually, you know, like in discovering the work of Howard Thurman, it's like this, this idea that God loves me became the prevailing idea, right? And I even saw the people who God sent to help me, uh, my therapist, my accountant, because I almost lost everything, mm. you know? And I had to like surround myself with like all of these practical people uh, to help me put my life back together. And, you know, for me, that was, I call it my cloud of witnesses. God sent these folks to help me. So I don't think that, that the ideal of therapy and the ideal of faith are two competing ideas. You know, for folks who might be going through depression, they may feel like God's abandoned them. But, you know, I'm here to say, just sort of like speaking, standing in my position of faith that God even is in the darkness, right? And these are not competing ideas. You know, God, as you said, I thank God for my therapist. I, you know, listen, it, it reminds me, you know, the, the sort of these stories about the, the person who was praying for God to send them some food and the guy comes along and offers the food and they're like, no, I asked God to send me some, you know, right? right. So, like you, you could be that person if you want, but you'll miss out on, on your help. You know, again, what you're, what you're saying resonates to me personally on so many different levels. Um, and this idea that, well, let me see, I, I'm, I'm big, I've been big, especially since the pandemic of getting beyond the hype of the Bible, meaning, we all, you know, even when we were raised in the church, we know certain scriptures, we've been singing certain songs. It is a, it's one thing to, to kind of be able to quote that stuff off the top of your head. It's another thing, and it's usually in those dark times, in those down times, in those depressing times, in those times when you feel unheard and abandoned, that if you hold on to your faith, at least for me, it made me got to deep, dive deeper into the word and say, what is he really saying? Is he really, mm -hmm. is he saying he's Santa Claus? No, he's not saying, it's not, oh, you pray and he gives it to you next week, like you said. That yeah. goes a lot deeper than that. And when you, and you know, and so while, if you hold on to the idea, which I do, that no matter what I'm going through, God hasn't abandoned me and God still loves me, then I, I stop looking at what did I do wrong and more what is, like you said, it's not about being, hearing from God, but what is God sending me? What is God, mm -hmm. and, and like you said- Where am I being directed? Where am I being directed, you know? And, and, and even when you look at the walk of Jesus, and this is not meant to be a, a theological show, but, but I, what I discovered during the pandemic is that everything that I might have been going through in terms of isolation, in terms of feeling alone, in terms of feeling abandoned, in terms of loss of resources or surrendering of resources, Jesus walked that whole walk if you, if you look through his life. It, 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 it wasn't like he was dancing through the, the tulips during his time. Mm -hmm. Every human, uh, you know, uh, 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 feeling, both positive and negative, he felt during this walk as a human being on earth. And there were lessons in that, 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 that you know, both informed me in my life in terms of how am I going to make ends meet when the pandemic has cut my income down to... Therapy, you know, it, it, it just becomes more practical. And I think often when we're we're approaching faith, we're we're approaching it almost from a more magical when I tell people God is very practical. It just seems like magic yeah. to us because we don't understand everything he's doing. I think, you know, kind of bringing things full circle back to sort of like this ideal of mental health mm -hmm. is none of us are going to be able to escape some level of pain, some level of trauma in our lives. And I think, you know, this is sort of the, you know, I feel like the, the work that I'm really inspired to do is how do we prepare people to deal with the pain, to deal with the trauma? Because in 
This is the only path to joy, to yeah. real joy. Yes. And, and what I say to friends, if you're an artist, you paint. If you go down this path, you're going to be a better artist. If you're a writer, you go down this path, you're going to be a better writer. I don't care what your profession is. Like, if you go down this path, like, you're going to discover more about yourself and tap more potential than you've ever tapped before. And I, I think that, you know, this is this is the journey. I don't know why it, it, it has to be this way, but it is this way. All of us are going to experience it. How do we deal with it? How do we process it? Um, it's really the question. And I think, you know, what I really want to help to do, and I think you're doing this work, is to shift the culture and the narrative around people getting the help that they need, realizing that we're not superhero humans. Like, you know, you can't take in all of this sort of news of people being killed by the police, um, you know, people being mistreated. Um, you can't take these things in and it not impact you negatively. It really does. You know, one of the things I do want you to go a little bit deeper on because it's a big theme of my focus, both personally and professionally, um, both through my work at Black Enterprise, through my, my public speaking, my activities outside of Black Enterprise, my mentoring, because I mentor you know, a bunch of people, um, not just Black people, not just Black men, but a significant number of Black people and Black men. And it's this idea that the point is joy. And joy in Black men in particular aren't two things that people think of in the same sentence. You know, pleasure, maybe, maybe, um, you know, success, maybe. But the idea that we should be living joyful lives as Black men, I, I won't say it's radical, but it's, it's something that people don't think of. Um, and, 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 and so I just love, the, love this idea that I told you, but part of the, the, my, my goal or my objective of therapy is to not lose my joy, to, yeah. to, not, to not forget to claim my joy. It, from a theological standpoint, I can't lose it, but I can fail to claim it and fail to Absolutely. claim it when I need it most. Because when you're depressed, when you're down, when you're, when you're you know, and there's obviously there's, there's other mental wellness um, experiences that beyond depression, the most important thing you need is access to the joy that is yours that is yours but if you don't yeah like you, have food, you don't eat it it can't nourish you you have money and you don't yeah. spend it, you can't provide for yourself if you have joy but you have been you surrender your access and your claim on joy then the joy won't help you even though you actually have it but you have to talk, talk to me about yeah. that dynamic because i think that's one of the most powerful things well, i think about the title of the book itself yeah this is one of the i think one of the most powerful takeaways from for me, from Howard Thurman, because he talks about when you discover your connection to the divine, that you what you're talking about is this inherent right to joy, a claim that you have, that you know that God loves you, that you know in spite of the world, the oppression that we face as people, um, the disinherited, I should say, um, that you have a claim to joy. And that knowing, like it's like, you know, it's, it's you know, it's, after we say there's some people who believe in there, there are some people who really believe, but I'm talking about knowing, knowing that that joy that you have a right to it. I think that this is, I mean, this is kind of, I think in essence, like what I'm, why I titled the book, The Joy of the Disinherited, right? I wanted to say, how is it that after all that Black folk have been through, Tomorrow, people are going to gather around the table and look at each other and smile and shed tears. Brings tears to me to think about it. Mm. Tomorrow's Thanksgiving. Folks are going to show up in spite of all that they've been through, being mistreated on jobs, passed over for promotions, all that's going on in the news, and still find joy. Wow. That is remarkable. Wow, we're going to do it Thanksgiving. We're going to do it again throughout the holiday season. I mean, we I mean do it that at is. We do it at family reunions. We. You're, it's you're, remarkable. remarkable, is it that's not that's remarkable. remarkable? Yes. People wrongly convicted of crimes, their families still come together, find ways to 
smile and embrace one another and not be bitter, right? Mm. That's amazing. That is that is amazing. And, and, I, and part of claiming joy is, is acknowledging that because so much of the Black experience is, is making like our trauma the point. Like the trauma is real and it's not something we should ignore. We can't pretend it never happened. We can't pretend it doesn't impact us. But when, you, I, I, I used to, when I was raising my kids, I always tell them when they complain about something, just look at both sides of the ledger. And if you look at both sides of the ledger, no matter what is on the negative side, you know the positive side is that much more. And a big part of overcoming, especially not just mental wellness challenges, financial challenges, um, uh, physical challenges, is not letting your mind get totally like engulfed in the negative Absolutely. side of the ledger. And, and, if we're, and joy has been, or our access to joy has been really the key to our continued survival and advancement as, as Black people in America. But I think it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not just for Black people in America. Access to joy is the key to survival of all hum humanity. Absolutely. That's what we're talking about is humanity here. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely. In, in, in a few minutes we have left, Kevin, um, I'm just so enjoying it. I know it's going to have a fun in this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, we talk mental health theology. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we, <laughs> and if you were talking about joy, man, I could talk about joy forever. <laughs> Because, yeah, in fact, that's why I want to leave it. Because I, I, I've been telling people, people ask me how I'm doing, and 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 I tell people I'm doing so well that it's almost embarrassing, and it's only almost embarrassing because we know we've been through a period. You know, I know in my own personal life, and of course, us as a nation and as a world have been through and are going through experiences with the pandemic and everything else that that have changed us forever, and I'm almost surprised almost that when you know when i'm brought through on the other side that i am actually in a good place and in a hopeful place and 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 so it, it speaks to this idea that you can get through and i'm just talking whether you're a person of faith or not the idea of joy and hope um and that, that even the the negative wilderness experiences somehow bring you out better than when you went in how, how does that just relate to your overall message of this journey to, to uh, wellness um, in general and for Black men in particular? You know, I, I, I like your, your question, but it, it's, it's sort of like, I think the way to answer it, uh, Alfred, if you don't mind, I want to read a, a quick passage that came to me from the book, and I think it's going to answer your question. Perfect. And this uh, is from the title essay, The Joy of the Disinherited. Uh, which there's a, you know, my book, as you know, is, is broken up into essays. Yes. Um, all of us need something to believe in. Even the atheist has confidence that a well-built chair will hold their weight. Even black, ma black matriarchs who bury sons, brothers, daughters, and husbands into the earth, saturated with blood and sweat of their ancestors, will sing about this joy that they have. I can still hear some of their voices echoing against the ceiling rafters of a country church on Sunday, rising above the choir's refrain and the rattle of the still oscillating wall fans. Anyone within an earshot heard about this joy, its good measure, and how it's been pressed down and shaken together. These matriarchs were clear about their joy's origins. The world did not give it to them, and the world could not take it away. While setting a pot of beans to boil or pinning up a bed sheet to dry in the sun, Ella Mae would softly hum about how she was coming up the right side of the mountain, not the rough side, that she was holding God's powerful hand and doing her best to make it in. My mother modeled Ella Mae's determined optimism and stubborn love and her refusal of a mediocre life and in her prayers laden with gratitude and thanksgiving. These days, I think, I often think about my mother's Bayan Hope and Ella Mae's songs and about her rose bushes. I think about these private joys they and my ancestors held on to through long days and lonely nights. 
I think about the remarkability of their capacity to find a heart to sing. And above all, I think about how this joy might be replicated for other heavy souls to soar. Wow. Man. Yeah, that's everything, man. You brought up images of my grandmother. <laughs> you brought up images of your, in the path that was trodden before we got here. The joy that produced us, the faith yeah. that produced us. That is, that is, that, I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> as, soon, as soon as the interview is over, I'm jumping right back into the book. <laughs> I got to get through it. No, listen, Kevin, man, uh, we're pretty much out of time. And uh, you've been so generous with your time today. I really, really thank you for for not just being on Beyond the Hype, you know, today, but for just the great work that you're doing um, beyond beyond the work work, you know, the CEO work, the, the leading a company work, but the broader work that drove you or guided you to the CEO work, because I think it was this, the, that they got to do the CEO work and not the other way around. Um, I'm just urging all of you to read The Joy of the Disinherited. Like I said, I'm just at the very beginning of it. And this man has got me buying more books to back up his book to <laughs> <laughs> context. I'm on Amazon, what's going on with dude? He's ordering books every day. Um, but 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 I, I just I just really thank you, man. I'm just glad I got that I get to know you. It's a privilege to talk with you. Um, you know, it, it probably no one's going to hear, be surprised to hear me say that you're doing God's work, but I, but I honestly believe that. And and I just just thank you for being on Beyond the Hype, man. I don't know if there's any final thing you want to leave with our audience. I just and, I just want to thank you, you man, and thank you thank you for indulging me. I know you didn't prepare for me to read um, from the book, so thank you for your indulgence there. And um, I just you know some some sometimes I've learned since I finished the book that you know I can answer the question just by reading. It tells you exactly what I think. So thank you for that. And thank you for the work that you're doing. I believe that you and I have a shared journey. Like we are shifting how Black people think about these issues. And that's a really important work. So thank you for that. And thank you for the work that we're going to do together in the future. How can my audience keep track of what you're doing? I know you, you they can follow up um, Hurdle. Um, I am on Twitter at KDetner. Facebook, um, Instagram, Kevin Detner. And again, um, they can visit the book's website, thejoyofthedisinherited.com. They can also learn more about our company at hurdle.health. But um, I certainly welcome the opportunity to connect with people. Okay, you guys, you heard it. And by the way, Christmas season, gift giving season, Kwanzaa season, whatever you, birthday, <laughs> this is a great, great gift that you can give to yourself and others. So let, let's um, let's let's push the joy of the disinherited. Spread that joy. This is the season of joy. And Kevin, man, thank you again. Again, thank you for being a guest on Beyond the Hype. Thank you, man. Yes, and this is Alfred Edmund Jr., Senior Vice President, Executive, Executive Editor at Large for Black Enterprise. You just listened to another edition of Beyond the Hype. This episode is sponsored by J.P. Morgan Chase. Listen, be back for the next episode, and thanks for being with us. <laughs>